my statement. Pope Francis, the Vicar of Christ, brings to our nation the glad tidings of faith, hope, and love. Mercy and compassion are essential elements of our caring and sharing ethos. These are the values that underpin our long-term development program for achieving inclusive growth, a lofty goal that President Aquino seeks to attain during his watch. In solidarity with the Filipino people, we extend to His Holiness Pope Francis our wel warmest welcome and hospitality. Mabuhay. That's the end of my statement. I'm now ready to answer your questions. Please approach any of the mics on the floor and introduce yourselves and the media organization that you represent. Hello, sir. Maria Ressa from Rappler. Hi, Maria. Hello. Nice to see you again. Um, Security threat, obviously, I mean, it's a few hours, it's an hour or so before he arrives. Where do we stand? Any other identified threats? What are you looking at now? Our government has done all that is necessary to ensure the security and safety of the Pope. In his speech to the nation a few days ago, President Aquino addressed the same concern. He said that there are no specific threats, only generic threats and that these are being addressed by our security agencies. And then a follow-up question, sir. From Rohan Gunaratna, who wrote Inside Al-Qaeda, he's the head of the International Center for Political Violence and Terrorism Research. He said that uh, in the Philippines, at least right now, it, there doesn't seem to be an established, it's certainly not a threat from the Abu Sayyaf, but from offshoots, smaller cells of um, BIFF. Do you, are, do you look at this as potential threats and is it something that, uh, that you're monitoring? Our security agencies are considering uh, every possible source of threat or danger in line with our objective of ensuring the safety and security of the Pope and of protecting the safety of our people at all times. Thank you. Secretary. Yes. Alexis Romero of the Philippine Star. Yes, go uh, ahead, please. May we know what will be the talking points of the President and the Pope once the pontiff visits Malacanang? The President also addressed that the other day. He said that as of that time, and I think as of now, there are really no uh, uh, set, there's no set agenda. As it is customary, Whenever the president meets with the head of state, he expresses to his counterpart the sentiments of the people. And this becomes especially relevant because our visitor is not just the head of a state, he is also the head of the church to which a great majority of our people belong. So we could expect that the theme of his visit, mercy and compassion, will find resonance in the topics that the two leaders might discuss as this relate to the, to the issues facing our people. Our own development program aims at lifting millions of our people from the margins of society and into the mainstream so they can attain a greater measure of self-sufficiency and a higher level of human dignity. That is the essential goal of our Philippine development plan. So it would be uh, uh, reasonable to expect that when the Holy Father 
dwells on the themes of mercy and compassion, uh, this will find resonance no, in the programs uh, that the government is presently working on. Do we expect uh, the two leaders to discuss current issues, for example, uh, poverty and the reproductive health law, which the, pre the church, of course, you all know, oppose? Well, there has been no intimation of any specific agenda item for discussion. The president acknowledges that in the past, there have been differences between the views expressed by some leaders of the church. And if ever there are differences, the, the government continues to adopt a post posture of uh, endeavoring to improve the quality of life of, of the Filipinos and to bring uh, justice and peace throughout our land. That is the essential focus of the administration's uh, socio, economic, and political programs. Thank you. Other questions? Considering that this is our first meeting, I would like to welcome all of you also to the facilities of this international media center. You will see that there is room for as many of you that would want and would like to work here. This venue is through the courtesy of our friends from the Manila Hotel. This is also very strategically located. It is right across the Quirino Grandstand uh, from which the Holy Father will be celebrating Mass on Sunday. And this is also very proximate to the Manila Cathedral, the Mall of Asia Arena, and the other venues for his visit that will uh, take him to, to different programs in Metro Manila. So you are most welcome to use these facilities. There are screens that are beaming to this location, the real-time live coverage of all the various events in the Pope's visit to the country. So if you are not able to, to gain access to the venues that have been laid out for this visit, this center will bring you there via the remote coverage facilities that will be brought to you in real time. Maria? I hope you don't mind, sir. I'll ask again. Um, how would you describe the Philippines that Pope Francis will be seeing when he lands today? Well, it is definitely vastly different from the Philippines that then Pope John Paul II witnessed in 1995 or two decades ago. To begin with, our population at that time was only less than 68 million. Today, we are a country of 100 million people. But having said that, we also acknowledge what our president has pointed out to in many uh, global fora where he has spoken. And that is the reality that we now find ourselves in a demographic sweet spot, uh, a big, percentage of our population are now into the youthful brackets where they are most productive, where they are most economically, uh, uh, where they're capable of being most economically productive. At the same time, this provides our country with a very valuable resource for implementing our development programs. And as these segments of the population prosper, we are also creating a healthier economy, a broader consumer mass base that could uh, provide the propulsion for sustained growth. But essential to being able to achieve this is the capacity of the government to provide the wherewithals in terms of both physical infrastructure as well as the intellectual capacity of our people to become most productive. And that is where 
our focus on socio-economic development programs would come into play. As we are aware, in our national budget of uh, 2.6 trillion, the biggest share of the pie goes to socio-economic development and social protection. We are very much focused on our poverty reduction programs. And if we will also recall Maria, uh, this administration has taken the initiative to approach the problem of poverty reduction from a totally new paradigm. The, the conventional wisdom was that government could just focus on attaining macroeconomic targets like GDP growth and hope that by some uh, uh, benevolence, by some beneficence, there will be a ripple effect that would allow those at the bottom of the pyramid to, to rise. That is not the approach anymore. There is a purposive and deliberate effort to bring the fruits of economic development directly at the doorstep of Filipino families that are living in the margins of poverty. And that is why this government has implemented and continues to expand uh, the conditional cash transfer program, which gives cash benefits conditioned upon the continuous enrollment of grade school children, their uh, health and well-being, the provision of livelihood and employment opportunities to the, to the head of the family, as well as the improvement of maternal and uh, child care, so that we also achieve the Millennium Development Goal of lowering maternal and child mortality. So this is anchored upon providing as many of our people the wherewithals for being included in the mainstream of economic growth under a new and purposive approach that was not there 20 years ago. So, so I think those are some of the essential differences that we may wish to look at. Then can I ask you to do the same thing for the Catholic faith? Uh, from 1995 until today, we've actually seen a decrease in the number of Catholics in the Philippines, even though it's still uh, Southeast Asia's largest Roman Catholic nation. How would you describe the Catholic faith in this country today? Well, I'm a secular person. <laughs> I will just offer some uh, observations from the sidelines. We will note that whatever decrease or some of the decrease may have gone to the, to the other segments that still believe in, in the precepts of Christianity, even if they, are no long, they no longer affiliate themselves with the mainstream uh, Catholic Church. So I think Essentially, we are still a predominantly Christian nation, and whatever new ideas have come to the fore, these are in the aspect of a more pluralistic, more open, more diversified society where we have become more hospitable to a broader range of views and options. And that is also the broad context uh, against which we have also uh, gone into reforms like uh, the Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Bill. Uh, perhaps that is also something that is worth noting as a departure from the 1995 situation. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm AJ Perez from OneBillionStories.com. Uh, I would just like to ask, uh, since we all know that uh, the president is Catholic, uh, is his being Catholic, uh, will it come into play within the next few days? The president is the president of all the Filipino people. When he talks tomorrow one-on-one -on -one with His Holiness the Pope, that will be his mindset, that he is the elected leader of all Filipinos. And the Filipino nation is not totally composed of only Catholics. Other questions? Yes, sir. Go ahead. 
Good afternoon, Paul. Uh, Pavel Vondra, Czech Radio, uh, public broadcaster of the Czech Republic. Yes, uh, welcome to our country. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, the Pope's coming to Takloban will uh, no doubt once again put uh, into focus the situation of the people there after the high on uh, Yolanda typhoon and we've just marked the anniversary last year and I know uh, your government was uh, adamant about saying it did all it could, but yet again, you cannot please everybody and probably there will be voices again saying we were expecting more. Can you say with 100% confidence that uh, your administration has done all it could to help alleviate the situation of the people affected by the typhoon? Thank you. Yes, we could, but even if we do, it will be considered self-serving and it will be better if we look or if we hear the assessments made by third parties like the World Bank, the United Nations, and other international agencies that have had the opportunity to look at a broader spectrum of international calamities such as the earthquake and tsunami that hit Banda Aceh uh, the, uh, and other major calamities no, like the earthquake in uh, Haiti. And by all reckonings, by all public pronouncements, we have heard authoritative sources point out that the pace at which we here in the Philippines have been able to transition from the relief and rescue states to the rehabilitation stage had been achieved at a much faster rate than what was experienced in the other countries. Be that as it may, those of us in government are also not completely sat satisfied with the progress that we have made. We acknowledge that there are important challenges that need to be overcome. We would also like to point out that this is the first time in the history of our country where working under the ambit of a law, the National Disaster or the Philippine Disaster Risk Man risk Reduction and Management Law of 2010, we were able to conduct a total and comprehensive province-by-province post-disaster needs analysis. And as a result of this, we have fully documented the full breadth and depth of the damage wrought by Typhoon Haiyan or Typhoon Yolanda. Every province which is subdivided into cities and municipalities, has already outlined the extent of the rehabilitation and rebuilding effort that needs to be done in terms of houses that need to be replaced or rebuilt, in terms of families that need to be relocated from danger zones, in terms of schools, health centers, and other social uh, facilities that need to be established. We also would like to point out and acknowledge the tremendous support that we have received from the private sector of our own country, as well as from multilateral and international donor agencies and organizations. All told, we could say that the experience of Typhoon Haiyan has given the Philippines a solid platform for its own advocacy of building back better and more resilient communities. And this has also been established in other fora like uh, ASEAN and APEC. And this is the spirit in which our government continues to deal with the many challenges brought on by Typhoon Haiyan. We are very open to suggestions and proposals from all sectors on how we can do better because we believe that there is always room for improvement. Yes, sir. Father Jerome Siciliano, Radio Veritas. Yes, Father. Secretary, what do you think will be the impact of the visit of the Pope as far as the, policy, the policies of the Philippine government is concerned? And again, all the other plans at legislating some laws. Let's say, for example, there's now a pending proposal to revive the death penalty and we are also hearing a lot of things about same-sex marriage so do you think this mindset that our 
legislators and other stakeholders will be somehow affected with the forthcoming visit of the Pope? Our country is a constitutional democracy. The basic principle is sovereignty resides in the people and all government authority emanate from them. Our laws and national policies are prepared by our legislators who are directly voted into office by our people. And so in all of this, Father, we are mindful of the sentiments of the vast majority of our people. We are looking at the issues upon which we could build common ground not the issues that divide or fragment us. And that is the thrust of our administration. If you would care to review with us the main tenets of our Philippine development program, it is anchored upon the philosophy of inclusive growth, which means involving as many of our people so that they can swim in the mainstream of social opportunity. We are looking at mainstream, we are looking at common ground, we are not looking at the margins, we are not looking at the outlying uh, issues that may create a lot of, uh, of mileage, but uh, do not represent the core of what our people believe in as, as, uh, as faithful. Yes, ma'am. Hello, sir. I'm G. Geronimo from Rappler. Uh, sir, may I ask, what, what do you see as the long-term impact of the Pope's visit for the Philippines? It is a very uh, high-impact event. <laughs> uh, I could say that speaking for myself. Of course, I was 20 years younger when uh, Pope John Paul II visited. But I have many friends and contemporaries that until today recall the... Uh, the, the personal impact that has made on them. And I believe that is the magnet that attracts uh, millions of Filipino faithful to Pope Francis, who is considerably a very charismatic uh, figure. The presence of a Pope in our country always brings on uh, a spiritual renewal, uh, a feeling of uh, tremendous inspiration because it is not every day that we are visited by the Vicar of Christ and especially coming at a, at a time when we are dealing with many challenges and we have a Pope that is able to give us enlightenment and guidance on how to discern what uh, appropriate responses we could make in light of these challenges. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Secretary Ina Reformina, ABS-CBN News. Um, how do you think, or how does Malacanang view um, the impact of the papal visit on the political landscape of our country, considering that we are on the threshold of another major political exercise? I'm talking about the elections next year. We are a country perceived to be very aggressive when it comes to campaigning and even on election day itself, um, we have statistics on election violence. How do you think will this theme of mercy and compassion impact on the 2016 elections? Thank you. It is difficult to imagine that our people, and especially our leaders, will not be profoundly affected by this uh, experience, uh, especially when you speak about mercy and compassion. If we translate these terms to our native language, mercy means awa. And compassion, according to Archbishop Villegas, is awa ng Diyos. So these are very basic, very uh, deeply emotional uh, concepts that could find resonance in the heart of every Filipino. 
And that is why I said in my opening statement that it is very much in line with our caring and sharing culture. Uh, I think one of the observations is that uh, we are able to sustain each other because of our extended family system. And the extended family system is simply a manifestation of a culture of caring and sharing. And when we speak of compassion as being awa ng Diyos, we are, we are talking of the faithful or faith-based dimension of our culture. And this is something that uh, is part and parcel of our lives as a people. Even our political documents, no, like the Philippine Constitution, begins with a preamble that says, that says, the Filipino people invoking the aid of divine providence. Most of our public events would start with some kind of invocation by uh, religious uh, leaders from various faiths. So this uh, opportunity to, to renew our faith, to discern the basis of our, of our faith, whatever this might be, I think will provide a good opportunity for Filipinos and especially our leaders to be more discerning, to be more reflective, and to, to be more considerate of the values that, that are uh, indicated by the two concepts of mercy and compassion. And I see that in the coming years, even our economic policy will amplify on the present focus on inclusive growth, more than just attaining uh, bigger GDP numbers. We are now more focused on establishing a more equitable and a more just society. So that would have definite implications on the political reforms that need to be uh, looked at no? after this season of, uh, of uh, grace, as it were. No? Grace from the apostolic journey brought on by the papal's visit. Uh, any last question before uh, Secretary Coloma rushes to Villamor? Again, I would like to, to say welcome to all of you. This is your home, this is your center, and please let our staff know how we may assist you in terms of your coverage requirements. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you, sir.